Hey everyone, welcome to Tales from the Pros, and this is Michael Giorgio, your host and co-founder of Imagine Ovation. I have a very special guest with me here today. He's a top 50 speaker in the world, New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author of numerous books, including The Art of Influence and Leadership Rules, and successful entrepreneur in influence, sales, and leadership, helping people achieve their peak performance. Please welcome the wonderful Chris Wyden. This is Tales from the Pros, where business leaders and influencers share their stories of inspiration, struggles, and successes. And I'm your host, Michael Giorgio. Chris, thank you so much for being with me here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it as well. Absolutely. Uh, I'm glad we were able to, to make this happen. I know, uh, as I mentioned previously, I know you're super busy, but uh, it seems that you ha- you know how to prioritize uh, your time very well. We could talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sounds good. So, Chris, kind of just jumping into it here, you know, due to, due to the level of success you've achieved as a speaker and an author and business leader and so on and so forth, how did you essentially – get to this position in your life? I know it's a loaded question. It's a big question, but give me a little background of your story. What really got you to this point? Well, uh, it's sort of a circuitous route to where I am. I um, uh, spent the first 50 years of my life in Seattle, Washington. My dad died when I was four. Um, He was making $90,000 a year in 1969. He died in 1970 with $30,000 worth of life insurance. So uh, he was he was making the equivalent of a million dollars a year, but didn't have much life insurance after taxes and burial fees and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So my mom ended up getting into real estate and flipping houses long before it was famous on HGTV. And so I ended up living in 28 homes and went to 11 different schools and was shipped off to live with relatives twice, mainly because I was a real kind of a bad kid. And, um, so I ended up getting shipped off. My mom sent me to my aunt and uncle's house for a couple of years in the fourth grade. She shipped me off to live with my older sister in the ninth grade, her and her new husband, the Seattle police officer. Um, I got involved in drugs uh, starting in the sixth grade. I made most of my money growing up uh, either scalping professional sports tickets on the street corner or betting the horses at Long Acres Horse Track. So uh, you're kind of getting an image of where I was going, which was nowhere fast. And uh, summer before my senior year of high school, I realized, wow, I'm about done with school and I better figure this out. And like everybody, I wanted to be successful. You know, I do this thing in my seminars where I ask people, how many of you would like to have a million dollars in your bank account? Everybody's hand goes up. How many of you would like to have a, a love of your life and great friends? Everybody's hand goes up. How many of you would like your children to grow up to be productive members of society? Everybody's hand goes up. How many of you would like to live a long, healthy life? Everybody's hand goes up. Everybody wants the same thing. And I did, too. I wanted all those things, financial security and love and friendship and success and, you know, all those kinds of things, leaving a legacy, living long. Um, I just had no idea how to get there. I had no idea where I was going, what I was doing, Um, but I did turn my life around, got into college. And as soon as I got out of college, people knew my story that I had, you know, been this troubled kid and now college graduate, top of my class, you know, uh, had been class president one year and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so I started speaking to high schools, summer camps, colleges, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, eventually it navigated over to speaking more for adults, time management. I did time management seminars for a while and then really focused in on leadership and particularly this, this idea of influence. Uh, so most of my time now is speaking, uh, to, to companies, uh, salespeople on how to influence the sales process or leaders on how to influence people who work for you and, and the like, uh, stuff like that. So I've had a few good breaks along the way. I ended up getting, uh, uh, able to um, ghostwrite for a guy named John Maxwell, who's one of the world's top leadership gurus. Um, ended up working with Jim Rohn for about seven years. He's a legend in the industry. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote Jim's last book, a book called 12 Pillars. I wrote the Jim Rohn One Year Program. Um, most people don't know Jim is the guy who gave Tony Robbins his first job. Uh, when Tony was 17 years old, he went to work selling uh, selling Jim Rohn seminars and Uh, Tony and I both spoke at Jim's memorial service in Anaheim, California. And then I was able to uh, have a television show with Zig Ziglar. I had my own television show in Dallas. And when the network asked Zig to do a TV show, he was getting a little older in age and knew he kind of had a a need for somebody to help him carry the the time. And so uh, one of the greatest privileges of my life was being able to 
um, to share that television show called True Performance. You can still find it online on YouTube, uh, but but able to share that with, with Zig and what a great guy he was. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I I love how um, how you, you mentioned that Jim Rohn was a you know was one of your mentors. So when you met uh, t- when you met Tony Robbins, how was he? I, I'm sure he's a he's a great guy, huh? I'm a huge fan of him. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. You know, guys like that, um, guys like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Tony Robbins, guys that become you know giants. They um, they're interesting, you know. Um, they are bigger than life. You, you don't get to that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. People say, oh, Donald Trump has an ego or they'll say uh, Barack Obama has an ego or, you know, whoever. Right. And I'm like anybody that that says I think I should be the most powerful man in the world probably has an ego. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican. None of those guys are going into it for public service. They they think very highly of themselves. And so Tony's an interesting guy. He's a giant of a man. That was a, that was the most surprising thing to me. I'd never met him before the funeral. Um, we knew of each other, of course, but I'd never met him. And, and he's really, truly a giant of a man. I, I understand that he has that gigantism, the same thing that Andre the Giant had and, you know, makes your brow really big and your hands giant. And, <laughs> um, but man, you know, he uh, certainly has accomplished something that no one has ever accomplished before. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, one day I'd love, love to meet him. So, uh, Chris, you know, how do you, I, I know you, you know, you teach a lot about success and leadership and I, I know you mentioned you teach sales teams and all, I'm sure all types of different, um, you know, teams within companies, but how do you really teach or coach others to become truly successful internally and externally? Because we know that it's not just about reaching a, a, a certain, uh, financial point, like you said, a million dollars, there's more to it. How do you, how to become happy? And when you're happy internally, you, you can be more successful externally, right? So how, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the first thing you have to understand is that success is completely subjective. There is no ab- objective definition of success. Uh, success for somebody is going off to, uh, Rwanda and running an orphanage for little kids for their whole life. Right. Uh, for other people, it means being a school teacher here in in uh, the states. For other people, it means uh, having a net worth of ten million or a hundred million or a billion dollars. Uh, for some people, it means opening up one hamburger stand, and for other people, it mean for other people, it means opening up a thousand hamburger stands. So you know, uh, to me, the first thing I have to help people understand because I, I do you know personal coaching. I, I coach a lot of executives and and entrepreneurs and the like and. And um, the first thing I help them do is determine what is their definition of success, because it's not my definition of success that that is going to determine, um, y- you know, what uh, what they need to achieve. It's what do they want to achieve? And then I help them achieve it. And I'll give you an example from my own life as a speaker. I could have spoken a lot more uh, than I did when my kids were growing up, but I just decided that I was going to be home for my kids. And I have friends who are on the road 200 plus days a year with little kids at home. Yeah. And, you know, I always say to them, hey, you know, these kids are going to grow up fast. Why don't you raise your speaking fee a little bit and cut back, you know, a third of your speaking engagements. You'll still say, make the same amount of money, but they're, you know, they're unwilling to do it. And I look at them and I think, wow, that's really kind of sad. Their kids are missing out. Uh, but for them, they, they don't care. That's their thing, right? That's what they want to do. So, um, you know, I, I, I think sometimes we get a little judgmental about how other people live their lives, but I think as long as they're not hurting anybody and, and uh, productive members of society, they just choose to live their di- life differently. So once we dis- establish what it is that they want to do with their lives and what definition of success is theirs, uh, then we have to develop the internal. And the internal is really two things. It's beliefs and thoughts. Right. I guess attitudes, you could put attitudes in there as well. But um, beliefs are the things that you truly believe to be true. It's what you believe to be true. Thoughts are just things that you can change. Right. So if I tell you, picture yourself in front of the Eiffel Tower, you could have that thought. You probably did have that thought. Most Mm -hmm. of the listeners probably pictured themselves standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Now, if I said, believe that you are standing right in front of the Eiffel Tower right now. 
you can't believe that you because you're not you you don't believe it right so there's a difference between a belief and a thought you can think i'm going to become uh worth a hundred million dollars but if your belief is that you don't have the skills and you don't have the talent and that rich people step on the backs of poor people in order to get there and you hear your dad saying we're not rich people we're blue collar people if you believe that you're a blue collar person you're probably never going to achieve that wealth of 100 million dollars even if you just say it to yourself over and over and over again so understanding the difference between core beliefs and thoughts what we need to do is we need to change beliefs and there's a process for doing that and then we turn it into thoughts that help support those beliefs and then you develop the kinds of attitudes that help you um, uh, that help you stay positive about those thoughts and beliefs and then thoughts beliefs and attitudes become actions and it's actions that determine results and results are the things that we're looking for so that's sort of a basic overview of the simple process of it but that's what I work um, that's what I work with people on in my coaching programs. And what about anything with in regards to like passion and joy of what you do? That 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 has to you probably coach a lot about that as well. Well, you know, it's funny. I um, there's a lot of um, difference of opinion on that. Mm-hmm. The the role of passion. You know, we were talking about Tony Robbins earlier. Uh, Tony Robbins and a guy named Larry Winget. Are you familiar with Larry Winget? Yeah, I've heard of him. I've heard I've heard of him actually. Larry's a business partner of mine. Uh, we have a, a podcast called The Real Man Podcast. Uh, people want to check it out. It's, it's for guys. It's at realmanpodcast.com. Larry's one of the most successful speakers the last 30 years. I mean, he's been doing 100 gigs a year at, at the highest wow. levels. It's a lot of money uh, for the last 30 years. National Hall of Fame, Speakers Hall of Fame, um, six New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling books. Now, you can you can understand from the title of his books things like um, you're broke because you want to be, your children are your own fault, and shut up, stop whining, and get a life. Um, the, the titles will tell you a little bit the perspective that Larry's coming from. So he and uh, Tony Robbins gave a speech once together, and uh, Larry was on first, and, and Tony came on right after Larry. And, of course, Tony was in the green room or whatever, and Larry gets up there and he says, you know, passion. Everybody tells you it's all about passion. you got to be passion. It's not about passion. It's about discipline. It's about choices. You can you can love your work and that's great. And if you're passionate about it, most of the time, that's fantastic. But what about the days you don't have that emotion of passion? You still have to go to work and do your job and be disciplined. And he said, now the next guy's going to come out. And people didn't know that Tony was coming out. He was a surprise guest at the event. Oh, wow. The next guy's going to come out and the, right out of the shoot, he's going to tell you it's all about passion and it's a bunch of horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much. Clap, clap, clap. Off the stage goes Larry. The guy comes up. He says, all right, we've got a special guest. Here he is, Mr. Tony Robbins. Larry's standing on the side of the room, you know, and there's only a couple hundred people in this room. It's a very high level meeting. Larry's standing on the side of the room and Tony comes out and literally within about 30 seconds, he says, how many of you know that all of success is about having passion in your life? And the entire audience like didn't even clap. They looked at Larry and Larry shrugged his shoulders. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, and so there are there are differences of opinions. Um, do I believe that passion is important? I do believe passion is important. Do I believe that you can be successful and not be passionate about it? I think that it's difficult because we are not only cognitive beings, we are also emotional beings. But do I believe that um, life ebbs and flows and passion ebbs and flows and sometimes you're really excited about it and other times it's just a drudgery? Yes. You know, you can be a college student and and say, uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to change the world as an elementary school teacher. And the first three or four years, nothing is better than being an elementary school teacher and shaping those little minds and (laughs) helping them learn those things. But eventually you're going to come to the point where you're going to go, this kind of sucks. Teachers, you know, they, they get the crap from the parents. They don't get paid much. They, you know, there's a lot of things that isn't really great about the teaching profession, right? Now, all of a sudden, five years in, they're not terribly passionate about it anymore. Does that mean that they just give up being a good teacher? No. So passion is great to have, and it can take you a long way. But at the same time, it shouldn't be the sole source of energy for your work and your life. I completely agree. And that's the reason I asked you that question, because I know a lot of people as well, Chris, that they they say, Oh, I love this. I want to do this. Or, you know, this is my passion. This is what I want. But when you, the problem I see with a lot of them, and this is even just startups, entrepreneurs is that 
they they have that passion and they have that joy they have that that uh even that you know in a sense that entrepreneurial itch that leadership itch you could see you know they, they want to do something great they, they have the intention to do something big in their lives but they don't execute it and with execution comes a lot of consistency hard work and discipline like you said um and you know you know will smith talks a lot about he's preaching about this all over the world about consistency and discipline um, you have to discipline yourself. You got to work hard. You got to you got to find ways to deliver and execute, right? And get out of your comfort zone. There's just all these elements combined. And I love how you said that because it's not just about passion. It's not just about having joy. In what you do, those are important. Absolutely, they can get you through some tough times. But it's not just those things. Um, yeah, I always call discipline the least sexy but the most important aspect of success. Discipline is not sexy at all. Like, you, you know, could you imagine if you had if you had a podcast called The Discipline Podcast? Nobody would listen to that thing. Nobody wants to talk about discipline. They might listen to an episode or two, but nobody's going to listen to The Discipline Podcast. They want the secret to business success mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. They want that magic bullet, that pixie dust, that unicorn ride. That's what people want. But so when you look at True successful people, true successful people are the people who discipline themselves day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. And at the end of 40 years, they've built something monstrous. So true. I 100% agree. I think uh, beautiful insight. I, I love it. So, you know, what do you, this kind of goes to the next question here, Chris. So what do you really consider, aside from passion, what do you consider? Well, I won't say passion's wrong, but aside from talking about passion, like what do you consider wrong ideas or concepts that others have described in order to be successful. Um, you know, we know it's not only passion, but what, do you think there's any incorrect concepts being preached out there um, that are, are really, or in your opinion, not true in order to, to reach a high level of success, whatever it may be for, for you, subjective, obviously? Well, all right. So half your audience is going to love me. Half your audience is going to hate okay. me. And I, don't even, okay. and I don't even know if you're going to love me or hate me at this, but I'm going to throw it out there. Um, the Secret, you remember the book, The Secret? Yes. That is the biggest bunch of horse manure <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. The only person who got rich from The Secret was the woman who wrote it and a few of the people who were who were big names in it. Um, you know, people always says, I'm just telling the universe that I want a Ferrari. OK, so the universe is a place, right. not a person. The universe is a place, not a person. Telling the universe that you want a Ferrari or a bigger house or a better job is like telling Detroit that you want a Ferrari or a bigger house or a better place. Detroit is a place. The universe is a place. So this whole idea, I'm just telling the universe, what it is, is it's a way for people to shirk responsibility for their own thing. Because if you're telling the universe for it and it doesn't happen, what does that really mean? means, well, maybe the universe didn't want you to have a Ferrari. Mm. Maybe the universe didn't want you to have a better relationship. Maybe yeah. the universe didn't want you to have a bigger house. So what I believe is, is, is in personal responsibility. It's your choice. I'm more of a, if it's going to be, it's up to me kind of thing, oh, right? I agree. Yeah. Now, I, I believe in God. I, I'm a Christian. I, I believe that, that God is, is active and, and that, that there is a higher being. And, and I do believe that God in some ways uh, interacts in the world. And so I'm not in any way saying I'm not spiritual. There's not a spiritual aspect to life. I'm just saying that, you know, I don't know. I'll give you a story. Remember, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but there's a guy and, and he's in his house and, and they get a warning that the flooding's coming along, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, and all of a sudden, the, the waters start to rise, and, and a big pickup truck with big wheels comes along, and this guy's on his front porch, and the guy says, uh, he says, hey, come on, jump in, the, jump in the back of the truck. We're getting out of here before it floods. No, 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 I'm waiting for God to save me. Okay, they take off. A little bit later, uh, a boat comes by. The waters have, have raised even more, and the boat comes by, and, and, uh, and uh, the boat pulls up next to the, the front porch, and he says, hey, come on, jump in the boat. It's really getting bad. You need to get, no, 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 I'm waiting for God to save me. So eventually, it's so high, he's literally on the roof of his house, and, um, and a helicopter comes and lowers down. They drop a rope, and they say, get in the, uh, uh, get, not, I didn't, not, did I say elevator? I meant helicopter. Yeah. Helicopter flies by, and they lower a rope, and they say, get in the helicopter. This is your last chance. He says, no, 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 I'm just waiting for God to save me. And so 
Um, eventually, as you can probably tell, he dies. He gets swept away in the floods and he dies and he ends up in front of the pearly gates and they let him in and he goes up to God and he says, God, I trusted that you were going to save me. And God says, what are you talking about? I sent a pickup, a boat and a helicopter. What are you talking about? <laughs> you made the choice to stay there, right? So here's the deal. There's a lot of stuff in this life that I think people push off to the spiritual when they really just need to get very, very material about it and say, okay, I need to get my ass out of bed today and I need to set an agenda for the day and I need to execute on that agenda. So I think a lot of people hyper-spiritualize uh, some things. Um, they, they emotionalize it. They say that it's about passion or it's about God or it's about the universe or no, it's about determining what you want out of life, developing a strategy and a plan and then executing that plan. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Chris, cause I, I'm Christian too. I, I've, I'm very spiritual. I believe in God. And, and, you know, the thing is, is that I've never read the, the book, the secret. Um, so I have, I have no say on that, but in regards to, people kind of over spiritualizing, uh, success or happiness or what have you. Uh, I mean, for me, you know, I, I believe God gives you strength and, or you, you pray for God to give, to give me strength and opportunity, uh, and to not be lazy and to do the best that I can in my life. And, and that gets me awake that, that wakes me up to know, you know what, I got to bust my ass today because it's not going to be given to me. There's opportunities yeah. out there. I know he's given me strength. I know, I know I have, I have wisdom. I know I have, I have people that are going to support There's people that are going to, they're, they're going to, that are going to help me. I do believe people come in and out of your life for certain reasons, but in that sense, it doesn't mean it gives me an excuse to be lazy. Um, I know some people that, that do that and they just say, Oh, it's, I'm waiting for, 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 for something to just happen. I'm like, listen, man, like you got to get off your butt and go find it. Cause you know that you have free will. You have, you there's, it's a big world out there. You got to go out and find it, go seek it. It's there. You got to work hard. Yeah, certainly, you know? and so, certainly, one of the mysteries of life is this: is this interaction between the natural, the supernatural, the spirit, and the material. Yeah, you know. But at the same time, you know, the old saying, um, "Pray like it depends on God, and work like it depends on you." It's probably a pretty good saying, you know. Yeah, I do like that. I, I actually I heard that years ago, but I'm glad you brought that that quote up again. Maybe I'll maybe I'll use it. <laughs> but no, that that's great, Chris. Uh, thanks for that insight, and I think that's I think a lot of people can really can really, um, you know, use that and put into their daily lives or they might hate this podcast or they'll love it, but you know what? It's okay. As long as they listen to it. <laughs> so, um, you know, Chris, with, with, with that being said, are there, are there like certain struggles or obstacles you feel that everyone has to overcome, uh, or might overcome in order to reach a high level of success and happiness? Do you think there's, do you think there's certain, just certain obstacles that, that, you know, everyone has to go through? Or you think it's just different for every single person? I think it's different for every single person, some of the specifics, but I think a few generalities that everybody experiences. I think, first of all, is the mundane. Um, everybody wants everything to be exciting, and yet most of life is not exciting. Most of life is the mundane. You know, um, I, I think it's one of the reasons why so many people end up getting divorced. Mm -hmm. You know, dating is so exciting. You know, you're going out four nights a week. You're, you know, you're going on trips. You, you tell the person you love them and it's so exciting. And you're, you know, you get butterflies in your stomach when you know you're going to see them. And then it's so exciting. You decide to get married and now you're living in a house together and, you know, you're doing the dishes and you're sweeping the floors and you're sitting on your butt watching TV at night. <laughs> and, you know, it's the mundane. And pretty soon it's like, whoa, this isn't what I signed up for. I, I thought it was going to be exciting. And you know what? It's not. You know, I lived in Seattle at the, uh, the first 50 years of my life, just moved to Scottsdale about a year ago. And some of those big companies, you know, Microsoft, ton of friends that made millions at Microsoft, ton of friends that made millions at Amazon, uh, Starbucks, you know, but it's mundane. You know, it's exciting, like Microsoft, oh, it grew so fast, and all these people made millionaires and janitors with Ferraris and all this. But you know what? You used to be able in the early days to drive by the Microsoft campus at 2 in the morning, and you'd have all the lights on and people walking around. They were there grinding it out mm -hmm. 2 a.m. on a Thursday night. You know, they, they had sleeping bags that they slept on in their, in their offices, on their couch, on cots. You know, just the grind of the mundane. Um, you know, I, I play poker. One of the interesting things about poker, I've played in the World Series of Poker. I've played 
you know, poker for a long time at, at very high levels. And, you know, people watch poker on television and it's, I'm all in and it's these big pots and it's, you know, and then they go and they decide, well, I'm going to go play poker. And they rush off to the casino or they go to Las Vegas for a, a convention. They go down to the poker room and they're all in and they, you know, hand after hand. What they don't realize is that those television shows are edited and that the, the best poker players in the world fold 90% of the hands they're dealt. It's just boring, wow. mundane. Yeah, they call it VPIP, voluntarily put into pot, which means they voluntarily, they have a VPIP rating, a, a percentage, the, the amount of times they voluntarily put money into the pot or play a hand. And, and most of the best po poker players in the world are less than 12%. Uh, that means 88% and above of the hands they fold and don't even play. So it's a lot of sitting around waiting for that moment in which you're going to play. And then oftentimes you get unlucky and you lose your entire stack and you're out of the tournament. <laughs> but, um, but that's life, whether it's marriage, it's a lot of mundane, it's business. You know, it's a lot of cutting code at Microsoft offices at two in the morning. Uh, it, it's a lot of sitting around folding your hands in poker. It doesn't really matter. The people who are the most successful, you will almost always find that it's, it's a mundane life for them. Um, I mean, think about what's like one of the most exciting jobs you could have professional wrestler right? Professional wrestler, right? You know, you're, you're on the WWE and, and, but think about those guys. They get about eight minutes on television. And with that eight minutes is exciting. You got 25,000 people screaming your name and you're on television and, you know, lights and sound and music and action. Eight minutes a day. The other 23 hours and 52 minutes on a bus, going to the airport, you know, lifting weights in the gym, like literally you can't pick a profession that that isn't driven by the mundane in order to succeed in the moments of excitement. And so this is kind of a uh, this might be a little bit of a tough question. So how do you become happy or not successful, but happy in the mundane? What you think it's a lot of is really mental or is it spiritual? You think is it is it something that you, setting the right expectations mentally, emotionally, spiritually, understanding that, listen, for me to get to this point, like when I started my company, Imagine Innovation, right, seven years ago, I knew it was going to be tough. But some days, you know, when we close a big deal or when you you win an award or you, you do a great job for a client or whatever it may be, right, it feels great. It's 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 awesome, right? Because you know you work so hard and you finally see some progress and performance. But you don't, you know, other people don't see the the 12 to 15 hours you're putting, you're working till three, four, five o'clock in the morning, you know. But but for me, I, I felt in order for me to 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 find my to fill my purpose, to do something great in my life, I know it's gonna take a lot of days that to, to be honest with you, suck, <laughs> you know, and they're not happy days. They're not great days, but there was still something inside of me that pushed me to continue. Yeah. Well, it's funny you should ask that about happiness. Um, you and I are recording this on October 2nd, uh, 2018. And on October 15th, 2018, so in less than two weeks, I have a brand new three-hour audio program coming out. I'm looking at it right now on Amazon, the pre-sale, um, called The Secrets to Life and Happiness. Okay. Uh, the Secrets to Life and Happiness, um, it, it's up right now. I don't think you can buy it right now. It says October 15th, 2018. Um, but there, there are some secrets to life and happiness. And I, I think one of the biggest things is understanding what you shouldn't tie your happiness to. So the first and foremost thing you shouldn't tie your happiness to is money or possessions. Um, because there is you know, a plethora of proof from every rich guy who shot himself that money does not produce happiness. And the fact is, is there are happy poor people and there's sad poor people. There's happy rich people and there's poor rich people. I mean, uh, unhappy rich people. Mm -hmm. So the money isn't the variable. You have to look at the variables and money is not the variable that determines happiness. Otherwise, all rich people would be happy and all poor people would be sad and unhappy. So money's just a and, byproduct, you think? Uh, money to me is irrelevant. Yeah. I often say, instead of talking about money, talk about hammers. Replace the word money with hammers. And imagine if somebody said, God, if I just had a million hammers, I would be so happy. <laughs> you wouldn't. You'd have a million hammers. 
you could uh, you could you could give those million hammers to a million construction guys who could build a lot of homes, but it's not going to determine whether you're happy or not. See, the reason I use hammers is because money is a tool. That's all money is. But the problem is, is that pe- most people view money as a sign of their of their esteem uh, or their prestige. And it's not. It, it simply isn't. And even if it is a sign of your prestige and people go, oh, wow, he's got a Bentley. He must be amazing. Until you find out he's beaten his wife and he's drunk six nights so a true, week. So true. Yep. You know, and not to say that everybody has a Bentley beats her wife and is drunk six nights a week. No, I know what you mean. I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that you know – your possessions and your money is irrelevant. It's great if you have it. You know what? Fantastic. Good for you. You can afford a Bentley. Perfect. Um, you know, I when I was uh, uh, 38 years old, I bought my dream home. I drove by this house for 21 years. 21 years. Now, let me tell you about this house. 6,000 square feet, 10 acres, half a mile of riverfront, swimming pool, pool house, 1,800 bottle wine cellar, quarter of a mile circular driveway, and my front gate was 500 feet long of brick pillars and wrought iron fencing. I bought this house at 38 after driving by it and stopping at the front gates for 21 years and saying, I'm going to buy that house. Bought the house, uh, moved in October 6th and middle of October that year, a couple within a couple weeks of buying the house, I poured myself a drink and I decided to go out and take a walk around the driveway. So I'm, I'm, you know, walking around the driveway, a shot of bourbon in a glass with an ice cube in it. And I was enjoying life. (laughs) I was enjoying life. I got to the top of the driveway and I looked back at the house and I will never forget the thought that I had. I thought, now what? Now what? Now what do I do? I got this. It didn't even last two weeks. The the fulfillment. You think about guys that get Porsches, right? They, or Ferrari or Lamborghini. They park it way out at the edge of the parking lot for like the first three weeks, four weeks, right? Yeah. Just can't get on that car and uh, they, they won't let anybody you can't don't, don't you can't don't bring that bottle of water in my in my car I don't let anybody drink in my car well six months into it they're parking you know way up front and they got you know old McDonald's bags on the on the back seat and you know it, it, everything loses its allure possessions and money lose its allure which is is why you have to find peace and happiness inwardly. And whether it's spiritually or in touch with what your purpose is or um, really knowing what your goals in life are and focusing on the, uh, in on those. I do 33 segments in this three-hour program, an intro and an outro, and then 31 lessons in there. But it's going through all these things, not even tying your, your happiness to a relationship. A lot of people think if I just find the right wife or if I find the right, You're right. husband, if I have the right friends. You know, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is something you do for yourself. And it's never dependent on outward circumstances. It's always dependent on your own perspective. Yeah, I... I... Uh, I I'm agreeing with you so much here. I th- we really do think alike. I, I agree. I mean, there's... I, I think a lot of people do tie um, their happiness and success to material things. And material things, I mean, they lose they, they lose its butterfly effect. You know, like you said, when you get into when you start dating and everything's honky dory and amazing in the beginning, but um, you know, it's it, it, that feeling is not it's it's you know you're not going to feel that way. Not saying that you're going to you're not going to love that person forever, but but you lose that initial feeling when you get uh, you know, when you go and buy clothes, you, you're excited to wear it the first time, but after the first or second time, you're like, all right, whatever. You put it in, you know, you don't care anymore. Same with the car, and we shouldn't tie these our 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 life's purpose, our happiness, or even our success, whatever it means to us, to these things. These things lose value. These things don't mean anything. They 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 don't. There's there's nothing. There's no spirit in them. There's nothing. That's why I think a big part of it. I love what Tony preaches as well. Is it's giving, 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 giving. You know. Um, you know, and they're great to have. Yeah. They're great to have. Yeah. If you have a if you have a beautiful car, fantastic. Yeah. That's great. You know, it's great to know that your car isn't going to break down on the way to work or or whatever. That's perfect. You know, one of the reasons I bought that big mansion was not to to prove to myself how great I was, was because I had lived in 28 homes and went to 11 different schools. And I wanted my four children to be able to be in a house where they could, you know, enjoy it. I'll never forget. It's still pictured in my mind. I can picture it right now. Um, I was in my bedroom, a very large master suite with a big balcony overlooking the backyard and the river. And my four kids down there playing badminton. And just realizing, you know, that they were living a life that I didn't have. And, and to me, that was happiness, not the big house, but having a house where my kids could feel like it was home. 
And, and you see, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. And, and, you know, the way you, you know, the things that you buy, like for example, the home for your, for your kids and, and your wife and your family to be comfortable and to, to live the, uh, a better life than what you lived is that's a good intent. That's a good motive. That's a good, that's a good reason and purpose. So you're tying what you bought there to good reasons. But a lot of people aren't like that, Chris, that's the problem. That's, that's why I, 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 I really appreciate what you're saying here. And I, I think people can really uh, find value in this. So, so Chris, you know, did you go through a lot of different obstacles? What were some of the toughest obstacles that you had to overcome in your life to get you to this point? You know, any stories or what did you really have to go through? Well, 28 homes, 11 different schools and starting drugs in the sixth grade is a, is a beginning. Mm -hmm. Or anything <laughs> um, kind of lately or the, the last 10 years or something, you know, to, to get to the, the higher level of, of, of your, of your purpose or just happiness, what some really tough, tough times. You know, I've been very fortunate as an adult. And I think part of that is because I figured out a way to live my life. I really believe that life is pretty simple. Um, if you live it one way, it, it turns out one way. If you live it another way, it turns out a different way. And, you know, Jim Rohn always used to say that success is just a few simple habits repeated every day. And failure is also just a few simple habits repeated every day. Right. And so your actions produce results. I will say, though, um, you know, that I it, it, it has not all been perfect. Uh, I went through a divorce about three years ago after being married for 27 years. Okay. And that was uh, that was hard. Oh, yeah. um, any any divorce is hard, whether you've been married three months or 30 years, you know, the tearing apart of, of people who at one time loved each other and and, uh, you know, yeah. fighting assets and, and, you know, what people think and people take sides and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and it was devastating for me, particularly as a guy, you know, who teaches people how to be successful. I suffered a lot of uh, embarrassment and shame. And, you know, can I really tell people, you know, what the right thing is and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, now that I've, I've failed to make that work. Um, you know, so it certainly set me back mentally quite a bit um, going through that. And then just uh, I went to counseling for a couple of years and just, you know, talked it through. I got a couple of friends who are pastors. I talked to them, you know, just a lot of internal reflection and deciding to make myself better out of it. You know, uh, I'm, I'm engaged now to a beautiful lady and getting married soon. Congratulations. And, yeah, thank you. One of the things that um, that I always say is. Um, if I'm going to make my, if, if I'm going to be successful in my second marriage, I got to figure a few things out because if my first wife didn't like it, my second wife probably won't like it either. I mean, you ever thought about that? Yeah. Do you ever wonder why, you know, second marriages are, are more doomed to failure than first marriages. And I think the reason why is, is because people don't do any sort of self-reflection. I'll tell you what I did once, uh, not too long ago. I sent my ex-wife a text and I said, would you be willing, I'm, I'm doing a lot of self-reflection, -re self-awareness. Would you be willing to share with me two or three things that you think I did that committed to the demise of our marriage? And to her credit, she sent me three things. She said, I think you did this and this and this. And you know, I think that wasn't good for our, our marriage. And I wrote back, I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And she wrote back with three more <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, and, and, and then telling me she wasn't going to help me anymore. And I said, okay, fair enough. But, um, you know, when you talk, for example, talk to a divorced man and say, why did you get divorced? You know what the average man is going to say? The first, what do you think the first two words out of a, the, the man who's divorced and you say, why did you get divorced? What do you think the first two words out of his, his uh, uh, mouth are going to be? My wife. Or, or my or her fault. My, or... <laughs> my ex-wife was, uh, you know, not a, go to the average divorced woman. Why did your marriage not work out? My ex-husband was the biggest jerk. You, no self-awareness. No understanding of what it is that they did to contribute, right? So one of the things that I think is important when, you, when we talk about failure is that failure is never a failure as long as you learn something from it. You know, failure can, it can be a great educator, but you have to be willing to, to learn. And most people just never learn from their failure. They make excuses. They blame somebody else. It was, 
it was my mom's fault or my dad's fault or my, you know, my boss's fault or, you know, the next door neighbor's fault or my dog's fault. It's somebody's fault other than my own. Yeah. And that's, that's why people repeatedly fail. I have a guy, I'm going to write a book someday. The book's going to be called Four Wives Can't Be Wrong. I was, uh, I was invited to serve on the board of a business in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And this guy, right after I got on the board, a couple months in, his fourth wife left him. And then as I got involved in the business, I realized that every top salesperson had left him and every president of his company had left him. They'd all left. They, they showed up, they stuck around for a while and they left. And the reason why is because he was a total prick. I mean, the guy couldn't get along with anybody. So I thought, okay, this guy's paying me good money every month to, to be a board member and advisor. So I said to him, I said, you know, um, have you noticed what the one common element is in all of these things, your wives and your salespeople and your, the president of your president of your company? Do you see what the common element is? And he said, no, what? I said, you, you're this one who's at the scene of every accident. And, and he, he was so offended and, and literally his fourth wife had just left him. And I looked at him and I said, look, so-and-so four wives can't be wrong. One wife could be wrong. Two wives, oh, that's too bad. Three wives, oh, there's something there. Four wives, if four wives leave you, you're the problem, right? Because they can't all be great. And I would say the same thing. Four husbands, four wives, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> but he didn't want to look at himself. Lack of self-awareness, absolutely. Lack of self-awareness, totally. Yeah, and, and I think that even probably goes back to uh, a lot of what you teach, right, is increasing self-awareness, being vigilant, being watchful of what you're doing. You know, we don't, a lot of us don't, this is the problem, Chris, is that a lot of us don't want to take responsibility in our own thoughts and our own actions. We want to blame, um, blame, blame, blame. And I learned that through my journey of being, a, um, uh, being an owner of a company as well as I was making mistakes. I mean, I, I, I would be the, I mean, I've made tons of mistakes, a hundred percent. And I'm aware of those, you know, I should have been more organized. I should have been more planned. I should have been more task oriented. I, I should have been more, more punctual. Sometimes I should have been, you know, in these things. And I listed them out. I'm like, what am I doing wrong here? What can I do better to be a leader in my company, to grow my company, to be a leader in life? And, and, and it's being aware. It's so important being aware and that it's going to make you more humble as well. Incre that's going to be more, make you, uh, increase humility. It's very important yeah, to be sure. to be humble. Um, that makes you a better leader. But that's just some of my take. But sure. Uh, so jumping a little bit here, Chris, what do you really consider the? You know, are, are there certain steps or processes that people need to take in order to become a good leader in life or in business or whatever leadership means to you? Yeah, actually, I just finished reading, rereading a book that I think is one of the best leadership books of all time. I, I run a national men's mastermind, guys that uh, that pay to belong to a one year program with me. And we, we read a different book every month. And we just read The West Point Way of Leadership. And uh, it was written by Lieutenant Larry Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Larry Donathorn. And it was fascinating because he says the first thing is that you have to learn to be a follower. You can't be a leader unless you can follow. And he tells about how these plebes show up at uh, West Point. And, and I'd never thought about it until I read the book. But you think about all these young kids, these young men that show up at West Point, now young men and women, they show up at West Point. And if you think about it, every single one of them is a leader. They were the president of their ASB. They were the quarterback of their football team. They were the head cheerleader. They were whatever they were, but they were the thing at their high school, right? Number one in their class, whatever, class president, you know, whatever. Uh, and then they show up, and the first thing they do is they strip these guys of all their inability to, uh, to lead, and they make them follow to the point where they are given literally um, – wrote responses that they have to repeat verbatim mm -hmm. to any sort of requests are given. They're not allowed to just speak whatever comes to their mind to answer a question. They're given the responses that they have to give and they have to memorize them and they have to follow. And um, it's interesting because the reason they do that is because in the military, uh, if you don't follow, people die, right? And so they teach them to follow. And so they have to learn to be able to follow and to respect the leadership of other people. I think the second thing is to improve your skills 
particularly your communication skills. People ask me, what's the top skill of leadership? It's always com communication. I think that that's key. Um, my book, The Art of Influence, is really great for leaders. Um, and uh, I talk about how to gain trust, respect, admiration, and loyalty in that book. And the four things that I talk about, you gain trust through integrity. Uh, a leader has to have integrity. You get respect through your own personal standards of excellence. People respect you because you excel in your life. Admiration comes from optimism. The greatest leaders are optimistic. Um, and then the last one is uh, loyalty. And loyalty comes from service, being a servant leader. And so developing the, the skill sets of a, of a leader and developing the character traits of a leader, very, very important. And then I would say, just say lastly is uh, establishing a vision, where you want to go, what you want to accomplish, uh, developing a, a strategy for accomplishing that vision and then executing that vision uh, and that strategy on a day-to-day -day basis. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for sharing all that. And, mm -hmm. and Chris, so just to kind of uh, conclude things in the podcast, I always ask the three hows. Now you did dabble in all of these, but in, in just one sentence or as, as quick as you can define them, how would you define failure in your opinion? How would you define entrepreneurship and how would you define success? Uh, failure, I would define as not achieving your specific goals. Entrepreneurship, I would define as the person who initiates capitalism. And what was the last and one? Success. Success. Success is not the overachievement in one area, but the balanced achievement in all areas. I love it. Everyone that I interview. Uh, it's it's crazy because some some of the interviewees they have some similar answers, but some people have some very very different answers. So I love to always ask the three hows: uh, how do you define failure, yeah. entrepreneurship, and success? And uh, Chris, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, thanks again for for being part of this uh, podcast and episode. And and can where can everyone find you? Uh, they can find me on Facebook at um, facebook.com forward slash Chris Widener Speaker. That's also my username for Instagram, uh, at Chris Widener Speaker. Twitter is just at Chris Widener. And uh, if they're available or they desire any sort of personal coaching, I also have a coaching program for people who want to become speakers and authors. Uh, they can just email me. My, my email is Widener Group. W I D E N E R group at gmail.com. Let me know that you uh, might be interested in some personal professional coaching or specifically uh, speaker and author coaching. Fantastic. Chris, thanks again. Thanks for being part of the podcast and sharing your story with us and your insights and expertise. I'm, I'm very thankful. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for listening. And this is your host, Michael Giorgio on Tales from the Pros. And until next time. Thanks, guys. Please subscribe to our YouTube page and also follow our social media. Uh, there are links somewhere around here. But uh, we really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for all the support. And I'm going to be giving you awesome content continuously. And we look forward to seeing you soon.